Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8. We'll do verses 26 through the end of the chapter. This is a, a true story of a man named Philip and an unnamed eunuch from Ethiopia. And Philip was an evangelist. And you may recall that in the early workings of the church, as the church grew, they needed to have different ones who would reach out to the widows and everything like that. Because the apostles said, it is not proper for us to leave the study and teaching of the word. So they said, we will, they prayed and asked the Lord to raise up godly men filled with the spirit and they would attend to those matters. And that was probably the first um, uh, time in the scriptures that in, in the New Testament primarily where we have anything that's related to the office of deacon today. And so they chose seven men full of the Holy Spirit to oversee those things. And Philip was one of those men. And from his great work in Samaria just before uh, meeting the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip was doing a great work in Samaria. People were getting saved. Multitudes were getting saved. And then he was suddenly summoned by the Lord to the desert hills of southern Judea. And instead of addressing multitudes, and I want you to catch this because this is very important. He was to bring the gospel message to one man. Say that with me, one man. One man. The man whom Philip found on the road, which led down from Jerusalem to Gaza, was none other than the secretary of the treasury for the queen of the Ethiopians. And he believed and obeyed the gospel and became a Christian missionary to the continent of continent of Elba, Africa. How many times have you heard our pastor and his wife refer to Africa as, we've, as they've been with us? And it has kind of piqued my interest. And I've just, you know, um, different sources that I, that I have, uh, Bible geography and stuff like that, have uh, just taken a look at that particular area. Nancy's grandfather on her father's side, was born in, born in England, and her father was born in South Africa, and uh, of missionary parents. And we have uh, a lot of stuff. We, we showed some of that stuff and to, to Pastor Dave and, and his wife, and they looked at it with, with great interest, but we got a hold of that stuff when we were visiting uh, back on the East Coast two or three years ago and went to see one of Nancy's cousins. And uh, he had the Bible that his grandpa had had. And uh, so Nancy has that. And copies, he made copies of a lot of the journal entries and everything like that. Very, very interesting. Anyway, that's kind of not only the connection here, but con the connection that we have. See, and this morning, uh, the the taping that's done here for Sunday school, and and then also for the morning service uh, on Wednesday, they'll be seeing it in uh, Africa. So that's interesting. Now, let's look at these verses as we go down through here. Uh, Philip. I put here uh, 826. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip. So 
like I said, F Philip was one of the seven deacons mentioned in Acts 6-5. And then following the stoning of Stephen, stoning death of Stephen, persecutions scattered the, the, the Christians. And of necessity, the deacons, including Philip, became evangelists. And as a result of Philip's evangelistic success in leading the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ, the eunuch, as we've already mentioned, became a Christian missionary to the continent of Africa. Now, I feel this is very significant, and I want you to see why. And remember Acts 1.8, where it says, uh, the disciple says, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's verse 6 of chapter 1. And he says to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. And then here's the great commission he gave. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the apostles... Apostles had witnessed successfully in Jerusalem to the extent that the leaders in that, in that region, the religious leaders, made the statement that says, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And they, they wanted them just to be quiet, not, not preach anymore. Said, so you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And then following the stoning of Stephen and Paul's attempt to destroy the church, that's what the... The, the NIV says concerning the ministry so-called that Paul had as he headed on the Damascus Road into, on his way to destroy the church. That's what the scripture says. Well, persecution once again scattered folks in the church into Judea, which is in close proximity if you look at the maps of the, of the Holy Land, and close proximity to Jerusalem. And then also to Samaria, which is the adjoining region to the north. And so the next step, I put here, the next step in the order that Jesus prescribed in Acts 1.8 was to get the gospel on out from Samaria to the ends of the earth. And moving the gospel into Africa by way of a converted Ethiopian eunuch employed by the queen certainly aided that to the ends of the earth effort. Okay? Second page there. Angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road. Now, the road descended from Jerusalem to Gaza, southwest of Jerusalem, near the Mediterranean coast of Palestine. And, and Gaza was the last settlement before the desert wasteland stretching uh, to Egypt, and this was the road, uh, the road there that they're talking about was the road at that time that most travelers to Ac Africa took. Verse 27. So Philip starts out. Now, <laughs> I think it's amazing to me the way God works sometimes. Faith in God, I put it here, faith in God can sometimes mean being ready to start out without an explanation. I put here as a reference Genesis 22 verses 1 through 3. That's the deal about Abraham. Remember that? God spoke to Abraham. He says, you know, I'm a, you need to go to a place that you've never been before. Pastor Dave and Elva, before you visited this area, had you ever been here before? They're going like this. For those of you who are watching, they're going like this. How many of you sitting here today, before God located you to Southern Humboldt, had ever been here before? None of you? Had you been here before? Had you visited here before? Before, you know... It's amazing. I brought my wife up. She'd never been here before. Well, the first time I'd never been here. Yeah. Yeah. 
but the first time I ever brought her, she never, well, she had been here before because we have pictures of her at the, and her family at the drive through tree in Myers Flat, you know. In 1955. In 1955. And I was probably working there as a kid, you know, you know, helping out, picking up trash or whatever at that time. But uh, that's the way God works sometimes. And he, he grabs, he grabs Philip and he says, I want you to, to go. And I want you to notice how obedient Philip was to leave a wonderful revival in Samaria and a city with all its conveniences and go to the desert to preach to one man. And he was not even told in advance why he was to go south or how far south he was to go. And Gaza was 100 miles from the revival. Does that hit you in any way? Huh? It's a long way to walk. long way to walk. And uh, this church, uh, we're heading into some uncharted waters when it comes to ministry. But I want to let you know, and I speak from a lot of years of experience, and so does Pastor Dave and Elba and some of you who have been in the faith a long time, that um, the God of the charted waters, charted waters, is still the God of the uncharted waters. And so that's what, that's what um, Philip was going to find out. So now, before going on, I, I just want to give you some quick information about Ethiopia. A lot more we could say about Ethiopia, but just suffice it to say that those who first settled in Ethiopia were the Hamites. And they were descendants. They weren't descendants of pigs. They were... <laughs> Did you get anybody get that? They were descendants of Ham, who was Noah's youngest son. And Noah, or Ham became the father of the dark-skinned races, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, Canaanites, etc. And they settled in northern Africa and western Asia. And one of Ham's sons was Cush. Mentioned that in, in the 10th chapter of the book of Genesis, verse 6. And interestingly, Cush is the same word used both in the Hebrew and the Greek for Ethiopia. Now, any questions or comments so far? All right. Verse 27 still. Enoch. Or, I'm sorry, eunuch. I knew it when I came out it didn't sound right. I looked at it. No, I didn't, it, wasn't, it says eunuch. Uh, simply a castrated male. Jesus had something interesting to say about eunuchs. Let me, let me read this from, from Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. Jesus says this. Um, let, me, let me find that my pages are sticking together here. Verse 12 of chapter 19. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. And the one who can accept this should accept it. So Jesus is doing some teaching in some different areas. And he he mentions this thing about eunuchs. So some were born that way. Some were, were that way because of, of what men did to them, castrated them. And then others just uh, would take a, a vow like of celibacy. And Paul mentions that in one of his writings where Paul says, uh, that takes place. And uh, if a person t- wants to take a vow of celibacy in the Lord and to do ministry, Paul says, that's a gift from the Lord, just as it is even if a person decides they want to be married and serve the Lord. 
So Paul says, don't don't look down on either one or look up to either one. Just just take it for for what it is. So that's kind of Jesus had puts the eunuchs in three different categories. But it's interesting to note that by the first century, the term eunuch had become uh, a government title used for an important official. And eunuchs were often employed by oriental rulers in high posts. And this was probably the situation with this Ethiopian eunuch because you see he was in charge of the treasury for Candace, the Ethiopian queen. So he had a very specific role and a place of, of prominence. Now, Candace, um, the name seems to have been a general designation for Ethiopian queens, much like Pharaoh uh, for Egyptian kings and then Caesar for Roman emperors. It was just kind of a, a name that they attached to them. And so verse 27 again says, this man, talking about the eunuch, had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Ethiopian eunuch was a Gentile. And I put here, many Gentiles in the first century had grown weary of the multiple gods and loose morals of not only their nation, but the nations around them. And they were searching in Judaism for the truth. And then if they accepted Judaism as their faith, they would obey all the rules and regulations of the law of Moses. And this would include not only being circumcised, but also being, being baptized you know, into the law of Moses, into uh, Judaism. And this type of convert was called a proselyte. They weren't real Jews. They just simply took, took that faith on. And Gentiles who did not become proselytes but did attend the Jewish synagogues to listen to the scriptures were simply called God-fearers. And as far as uh, this Ethiopian eunuch, we, 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 we can't be sure into which camp, uh, he, you know, camp category he actually fell. But nevertheless, the important thing is he had gone, for one reason or another, had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Verse 28. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot. The chariot referred to in this passage is, uh, was probably a stately looking um, ox-drawn wagon. Most likely the eunuch was part of a caravan journeying in the same direction, just kind of moving slowly down the road. You've seen these you know, if you've watched some of the epic movies and stuff like that, you've seen these caravans. And, and, and then in the, in the U.S., in the days of the early settlers, we've seen the wagon trains as they move through. They don't go a whole lot of speed unless somebody's chasing them. You know, uh, Ben-Hur, you know, that, that's kind of a... But uh, this, this thing was probably just kind of moving along. And probably because you see this eunuch had a place of prominence. And so that's why I put here it was probably a stately looking ox drawn wagon, kind of stood out from the rest. And moving slowly down the road, and the chariot was probably driven by someone other than the eunuch. Now, enter Philip. Verse 29. The Spirit told Philip, Go to the chariot and stay near it. So I want you to get this picture of, of Philip heading out from the Sumerian region. And he's heading out and he's just trucking down the road. I wonder where I'm going. Where am I going? Where am I going? Lord? Lord? But he just keeps going. Keep going. And then he, he comes upon this caravan that's moving down the road very slowly. And Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, that chariot over there, I want you to go 
and stand near that chariot. If you have the King James Bible, it, the, it says, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And the primary meaning of join means to glue or cement together. And in its general uses, I, I put here, it means to unite or join formally. And the thought here is that Philip was, go, was to go to the chariot, stick to it like glue, Don't lose sight of it. Don't leave it until the purpose for which he went to the chariot was accomplished. And so Philip, knowing a little bit about what this term join meant in the language of that day, I believe that's the way he understood it. So he went, stuck to that thing like glue. So the scripture says in verse 30 that Philip ran to the chariot. I love that. Ran to the chariot. And uh, so I put here, Philip hightailed it to the chariot and heard the man reading. Now it was customary uh, in those days to read aloud, out loud, whether if you were just sitting in the square or whatever or sitting on a bench. And, and you were reading, whether you were reading a book, whether you are reading a, the scroll of the scriptures or whatever, they read out loud. And it could very well have been in a situation like this, there were other, uh, there were other uh, carts around, there were other chariots around, and, and uh, some Bible expositors believe that, that uh, the Ethiopian unit could have even been talking very loud so people could hear. We don't know for sure. But at any rate, at any rate Philip heard it. And notice, let me read these next few verses. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and then, well, let me stop there. But simply, here, here's, a, here's a capsule of, of verses 30 to 34 I put here. The eunuch was reading from an Old Testament scroll from what we now know to be Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And it lists it here in verse uh, 32. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. That's from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. And so hearing him read, Philip simply asked him, if he understood what he was reading. There were, I thought of different ways I could have approached this particular topic today. And I I thought as I went down through it and and I made some notes that I didn't necessarily include all all of them here. But um, this is a a wonderful uh, illustration on how to witness to somebody. Because you you go alongside somebody. The Holy Spirit directs you to a person or a group of people. And then um, you pay attention to what they're saying. You know, if I'm, if I'm in a group where, like if I'm at a wedding, if I'm doing a wedding, and uh, like I, I did here a couple of weeks ago, and where some of the folks aren't church people. I just listen. Before the ceremony and then even after the ceremony, I'll just listen to what they're talking about. And if they notice, it's interesting, if they notice that I'm listening and they've just said something of a spiritual nature, Guess what they will do? Well, Tom, what do you think? I love it when someone says that. And I'll say, do you really want to know what I think? Well, sure. You're here. You're a preacher. You're a Christian. Share. And so you get an opportunity. And a lot of times in ministering to people, I don't know how many times down through 
the 50 plus years that I've been a believer, that in talking to somebody, in counseling with somebody, especially people who are struggling, I'll say, you know, I faced a similar thing in my life. Do you mind if I tell you how I handled it? Well, no, I don't mind at all. And so you share. And if you're a believer, if you are a Christ follower, and you've had different things that come up in your life, especially stressful situations, hopefully you've gone to the Lord about those. And, and when God has brought you through those, you need to write that stuff down. My files are full of, my, the Bibles that I have are full of notes where, and dates where I say, okay, this is, this is the verse God used when I was going through this. And so you can look back on that and say, okay, God got me through that. But, but this Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading aloud from that. And so Philip comes alongside him and he said, um, do you understand what you're reading? Philip didn't know whether the, the eunuch understood it or not. But he wanted to find out. And I believe all along the line, God is ministering with him and leading him. To do this. And, and the Ethiopian eunuch says, How can I? Unless someone explained it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. He was reading this passage of scripture, happens to be from Isaiah. And then, needing someone to explain it to him, the eunuch invited Philip to come up in the chair, sit beside him, and provide information as to whether Isaiah was talking about himself or someone else. I wrote down here for 835 in capital letters. I love this verse. This next verse, verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Let's just all say together, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. See? Jesus is in all the scriptures. And uh, Philip was familiar with those scriptures. And so he knew here in Isaiah chapter 53 that it was talking about Jesus. And I put here, Jesus was the one who was led like a sheep to the slaughter. Jesus was the one who was like a lamb before a shearer and was silent. Jesus was the one who was humiliated and deprived of justice. And Jesus was the one whose life was taken by crucifixion from this earth. Scripture says, Philip began with that very passage. And I put here, you got to remember that Philip was an evangelist. And as such, he probably did not confine his remarks to just the Isaiah passage. And he no doubt showed from the scroll, the sacred scroll, scroll in the hands of eunuch, and based upon the stuff that Philip knew that wasn't necessarily perhaps in that scroll, but he began to share with this Ethiopian eunuch the fact that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Okay? The Ethiopian eunuch, remember, had just, been, had just worshipped in Jerusalem. And as was custom in their synagogues, they would read scriptures, and a lot of those referred to the Messiah. But they didn't believe that just several days before that, several weeks before that, the Messiah had come and died. 
a few years before, of course, he'd come, and then, but a, just a, a, a few weeks before that, he had he had been crucified. And they didn't. That wasn't something that they didn't believe that was the Messiah. And so, I believe that Philip just shared with this eunuch that Jesus was the Messiah, that he recently had fulfilled the writings of the prophets by his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. So he gave. I believe he, he, he gave a clear presentation of the gospel message to this Ethiopian eunuch. Verse 36. Well, what I like, it says, Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And when you share, when you sit down or stand around and you share the gospel with, with somebody, you need to share all of it in a nutshell, including what I, what I put here. That including the death, the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and soon coming again of Jesus Christ. And then once a person believes, then you need to share with them what they need to do. Either put something in their hands either mentor them. I'm so thankful for those who mentored me. I mean, right out of the chute. Okay? Uh, saved on a Saturday night, and, and I was sitting, and people were discipling me uh, Labor Day Monday on the beach in one of the beach towns in, in Southern California. And because they asked me, why, how I happened to come to know the Lord when I told him I, I'd come to know the Lord on Saturday night and went back. I didn't tell anybody that I was AWOL. I was absent without leave from the Navy. I just went back and turned myself in. I didn't know what was going to happen. But I went back and turned myself in and, and God miraculously uh, had, had somebody there to stand my duty because that had never happened to me before. I'd never done anything like that before. I had a, had a clean record. And they thought, well, maybe Tom just went up north to Long Beach or L.A. and, and didn't get back, you know, because I wouldn't ride. I'd hitchhike. And uh, well, maybe he didn't get back, so I'll stand his duty. Well, no, I was AWOL. I was, you know, I didn't want to go back anymore. I just wanted to come home and, and, and hide out up here in the, in the Redwoods at home. And, but God saved me, see, on that Saturday night at that place. And I went back, turned myself in. And then I knew, because the announcements they gave, that they were, the servicemen center was having a beach party on Labor Day. So I, I called Sunday afternoon, and I said, what do I need to do to go to that beach party? So they told me what I needed to do, so I went down there and, and uh, caught the bus out with them. And, and then, of course, I was so thankful, not only for the director of the center, but for other Christians guys my age who came alongside of me so you're brand new uh, you were here Saturday night weren't you yeah so what happened to you how come you're back today well I gave my heart to Jesus so tell me I said well I don't know that much about it I don't you know I simply that fellow right over there Charlie he remember he he talked and and said that I need to make a decision so I made a decision here I am and they begin to tell me about the stuff now that I need to do. Come to the Bible study. And so I was thankful for that. And so when you, when you sit down with somebody, you're standing with somebody, and, and you have a wonderful opportunity to lead them to Christ, or, or if you're not comfortable with sharing them gospel message, figure out some way to get them in the door here. And, and you know and I know that we've got people here that will share with them. Okay? But anyway, God provided that with Philip. And he probably told Philip, okay, now that you've trusted the Lord, uh, one of the things, you need to be baptized too. And so he got, he got the whole package in a nutshell. And so as they're heading down, and all of a sudden they see this body of water. And uh, the eunuch says, uh, as they traveled along the road, verse 36, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? You know, we were just talking about it. And here's the water. 
Let's take advantage of it. I want to be baptized. And so he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Now, <laughs> Nancy's always loved this part here. When they came up out of the water, now I want you to picture this. This actually happened. Okay, this actually happened. You'll hear me say time and time again, not only the fact that this, this stuff actually happened, but that it is not Mother Goose and Dr. Seuss. It actually happened. And so they come up out of the water. You got to catch this now. Don't miss it. They come up out of the water. And so the Philip, Philip the Ethiopian eunuch turns to say to Philip, gosh, what he was gonna say, wasn't that great? But didn't I? Philip ain't there. So Pastor Tom, will you explain to me what that was all? No, I can't. Just go with what it says here, okay? When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Snatched him away. Caught him away. It's the same word here, snatched or caught away, that's used of the church when it says that we will caught up to be caught up together, we will whisk away to meet the Lord in the air. And the eunuch did not see him again. What's the next verse, Nancy? Say it. I put here a note in verse 39. Philip is then suddenly and miraculously whisked off by the Spirit of the Lord to his next assignment. And God had other work for him. As for the unit, Ethiopia now had a rejoicing Christian secretary of the treasury and the church had another missionary. Because it says, and the Ethiopian unit just went on rejoicing. Rejoice. Hmm. Now, Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now, the note I made here on this verse, is, I say, Azotus is where Philip was whisked off to. It was about 20 miles from Gaza and about 60 miles from Caesarea, which was a harbor city. And Philip preached in the towns from Azotus to Caesarea where he probably took up residence. And I say that because the next time we read in the scriptures anything about Philip is about 20 years later and he's still in Caesarea. Acts 21, I made the note there. Acts 21 verse 8 says this, where Paul, he's doing some traveling. And it says, Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. And it says, Philip had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So Philip went to Caesarea, probably settled down there, got married, had at least four daughters who were involved in ministry. I put here, and as I finished the, the notes there on Friday, writing down the stuff, I just kind of leaned back in my chair at my desk and I thought, what a story. And it's true. 
And it's a great illustration of God's interest in a person and that that person would find salvation. And it also shows how God can miraculously orchestrate situations and circumstances so that one person can be reached with the gospel and, as a result, use that person to help reach an entire continent with the gospel. Mm. I would like you to, this afternoon or at least this week, has just kind of a, a practical way of applying this to you is just think back to the time when you first trusted the Lord. And if you can even think a little bit, chronicle the circumstances that led up to that. And it's amazing. You know, I just think of my my own experience. Little snot-nosed kid from Myers Flat. And God takes, puts him in the Navy and it's amazing. Amazing. And I do not know how many other servicemen came to know the Lord that Saturday night that I did. But I do know this. I did. See? And the circumstances about that. And as far as this Ethiopian eunuch was concerned, I wrote this down, the last sentence here. Irenaeus, Irenaeus, an early church father who lived between A.D. 30 and A.D. 2002, wrote that the eunuch returned to Ethiopia and became a missionary to his own people.